It's Friday, everyone. What do we do on Fridays here at the Hint Hive? That's right, we smash the patriarchy. Hey there, Hive. Welcome back to the Hint Hive, amplifying women's voices. I'm your host, Kelly Hint, queen bee of this hive, and today we're tackling a topic that doesn't always get the spotlight it deserves, financial independence. We're breaking down barriers, shedding the silence, and reclaiming power in a space where women have been kept on the sidelines for too long. Money. <laughs> Why on earth is it that talking about money feels so taboo for women? Is it because we've been conditioned to keep our voices small when it comes to finances? Or maybe it's because society's narrative around wealth and power doesn't seem to make room for us at the table. Well, today we are ripping all of that up. We are pulling back the curtain on financial independence and showing you that not only is it okay for women to be wealthy, it's almost essential. Your financial freedom isn't just about money in the bank. It's about self-worth, security, and breaking the chains of dependency. By the end of this episode... I hope that you will be ready to step into your financial power like the badass that you are. So grab your coffee, your tea, or that weird green juice, or heck, even a cocktail, I won't judge, and let's get into it. All right, let's kick this off by talking about why money matters, especially for women. Historically, we've been told that money isn't our domain, Men brought home the bacon and we were supposed to manage the household, right? Wrong. That outdated narrative is what has kept generations of women financially dependent on men. And while it might have worked in the past, kind of, today it's downright dangerous. Why? Because financial independence is the foundation of freedom. When you have your own money, you can make your own choices. You're no longer bound by the financial limitations of a partner, a family member, or even a job that undervalues you. Financial independence lets you walk away from toxic relationships negotiate better pay, and choose the life that you want to live. It means that you can buy that house, start that business, or travel the world. Whatever your version of freedom looks like, it's within reach when you take control of your money. And listen, I get it. Talking about money can feel uncomfortable. Many of us were raised not to discuss finances, let alone understand the complexities of saving, investing, and planning for the future. But here's the deal. Money is power. And it's time for us to stop feeling guilty about wanting it. We deserve to be financially secure and thrive just like anyone else. Period. Let's dive deeper into that discomfort around money. Why does talking about finances bring up so much fear for so many women? Here's where the therapist in me steps in. A lot of it comes from our upbringing. Maybe you grew up in a family where money was scarce, so you learned to fear not having enough. Or maybe you watched your mom or another female role model struggle financially, and that left an imprint on you. Or perhaps you were taught to rely on someone else for money, and now the idea of standing on your own feels overwhelming. Well, unfortunately, that fear is valid. It's real. But here's what I want you to remember. 
Money isn't just numbers in a bank account. It's an energy exchange. And you have the power to control that energy. Start by examining your relationship with money. Ask yourself, how do I feel when I look at my bank account? Do I feel anxious or am I avoiding it altogether? Do I think I'm bad with money? Do I feel like I deserve to be wealthy? Spoiler alert, you do deserve it. But changing your financial mindset takes work. It's about unlearning those old toxic beliefs and replacing them with new ones. You need to shift from a scarcity mindset, where you're constantly afraid of running out of money, to an abundance mindset, where you trust that there's more than enough to go around and that you are capable of creating and managing it. Now, I grew up in a generation where not everybody's moms worked. I grew up in a generation where the typical family household looked like a mom, a dad, and kids. Sometimes there was divorce involved. Sometimes there was blended families involved. But regardless, it was opposite gender parents. And a lot of the time, it was dads going to work, mom staying home. And so... I hold, I'm just going to put this right out there, I hold no animosity towards my mother um, for not teaching me about certain types of financial strategies or saving for retirement or any of that. Because you know what? My mom comes from a generation where there was absolutely no discussion about any of that because it wasn't a woman's place. And so again, I I don't have anger or frustration or any of that towards any of my foremothers, towards any of the women in my family line. As a matter of fact, I have a lot of positive feelings about the women in prior generations in my family because they survived it. <laughs> I mean, I can't imagine. I'm I'm someone who works, obviously. Um, and so I have my own money, right? Um, But there was a point in time when I didn't work because I was staying home to raise children. And let me tell you, that was, I don't know how to say this without sounding like a jerk, but it was, it was a very tough time for me because asking my husband for money so I could go get tampons was humiliating. I wasn't working. And so I had to ask him for money and that it didn't sit well with me. And then to make matters worse, my husband and I were very poor um, when we first started our family. And so when he would say to me, well, why do you need that brand of tampons? Why can't you get this brand that's cheaper? Um, Why do I have to explain why I want a particular brand of a product that is being inserted into my body, right? I I got so frustrated having to justify stuff like that. And it's not because my husband was a controlling nightmare. Um, sometimes, okay, so my husband and I are both, we're both the oldest of our siblings. And so... <laughs> There's a little bit of headbutting as the oldest kids that happen at times because we both are kind of used to like bossing other people around, right? And so when you have two oldest children who marry each other, sometimes there's a little bit of a a clash that happens. And so, yeah, there was a little bit of that that happened, um, but that was all part of the learning process of my husband and I learning how to be married and how to be in a relationship with each other. We figured that communication out uh, too far down the road, I will say. Um, we spent a lot of years just butting heads. But it it just it bothered me to have to ask for permission for something. And then if my husband made the mistake of questioning why this, not that, or whatever, basically trying to insert 
his opinion into the matter, it inflamed me. Because I don't feel like I should have to justify why I want Tampax instead of Kotex. You know, although it wasn't that. It was more like Kotex versus like the generic brand. Ew, has anyone ever used generic brand tampons? They do not hold together the way like Kotex or Tampax does. Sorry. Um, and, And for all the guys listening right now, welcome to a woman's world. We talk about things that may gross you out. Um, But anyway, back to the issue at hand, financial independence. So my husband and I actually spent, um, I think it was probably the first 10 years of our marriage, we had separate bank accounts. So obviously, I had a bank account from because I've been working like on the books, since I was 15. And so I wanted to save up money for a car when I was 15. And so I opened up my own savings account. And then I had a checking account and my husband had a life before me also. And so he worked when he was a teenager and he had his own accounts. So when we got together and yes, for those who are Christians, we lived in sin, right? Like we, we, um, we did everything backwards. We moved in together we had a baby and then we got married because, you know, I don't believe in doing anything the quote right way. Um, so when we moved in together, we each had our own separate accounts. And so it started out, uh, my husband would pay rent and he was my boyfriend at the time. Um, so he would pay rent and I'd buy groceries. And then we started a family and got married and we were still having separate accounts. Um, I worked up until I gave birth to my son and then let's see, I tried going back to work when he was a few months old and it didn't last long. I, I hated having someone else watching my child. So we made the decision, despite the fact that we were not financially wealthy people, um, we made the decision that I would stay home with the kids. So, boom, money gone for me. I was earning no more dollars. And so I had to ask him for money when I needed something. And that was the beginning of the end. <laughs> of our financial happiness, if you could even say we had any financial happiness, because again, we were not very well off. Um, so what I learned during, you know, the next few years of our marriage was we would get resentful towards each other. Um, if we went out to eat or something with friends, he'd say to me, oh, you're going to pay for it. And I'd say to him, um, you're going to pay for it. And we would just bicker over finances constantly. And then after a decade of being together, we finally decided, okay, we're being idiots. Let's combine our finances. For some of you, you may be shocked that we combined finances. In others, you may be shocked that we didn't combine finances initially, um, depending again on like how you were raised. And So once we combined our money, we had a better sense of what we could afford and where our money was going, and it all worked out so much better. Um, But I will say, I still had a savings account of my own, and uh, my husband had a savings account of his own for a while, too. So we had our main account that we put our money into and we paid all of our bills jointly out of it and it worked so much better. And I hung on to my own separate savings account for a while until I felt more confident that I didn't need a plan B, an escape. Because for a very long time, I did not trust men, even the one that I married. And I never wanted to feel trapped. And so then, you know, when I had gone back to work when my kids were in school, 
I was earning money again and, you know, feeling a lot better. And I was trusting our marriage. I was trusting my husband. And so the combined finances were working well. And I like we dissolved anything that was individual and everything was combined from then on, including our savings accounts. Now, your particular situation may go a little bit differently, and that's okay, too. If you don't, ladies, if you don't trust your spouse, if you think that you need a, an escape fund, do it. I'm, I'm not going to tell you not to. Um, because again, as a therapist, I've worked with many women of many different types of life situations, and they have needed an emergency fund to escape dangerous situations. So I will never tell a woman not to do that. But um, all right, so we've talked about why money matters, and how to address those financial fears. So let's get to the juicy part. Let's talk about how to build financial independence. So step one, know your numbers. First things first, you have to know where you stand financially. I know, I know, looking at your finances can feel like pulling off a Band-Aid, but trust me, it's necessary. What's coming in? What's going out? What debt are you carrying? Take a good hard look. Because financial independence starts with awareness. And this is whether you have, whether you are with a partner or you are single, whether you share finances with a partner or have separate finances with your partner. Step two, save like a boss. Emergency funds are non-negotiable. As women, having a safety net isn't just practical, it's empowering Aim for at least three to six months worth of expenses saved up. And if that sounds like a lot, just break it down. Start with one month and then build from there. Rome was not built in a day and neither is your financial empire. Step three, invest in your future. Here's where women tend to lag behind, myself included, unfortunately. We are often more conservative with our investments, or we leave it to our partners. No more, ladies. Learn about investing. You do not need a degree in finance to get started. There are tons of resources out there, whether it's stocks, real estate, retirement accounts. Start putting your money to work for you. I wish someone had told me this, but again, it just wasn't a thing in my day to talk about retirement, to save for retirement. It just, it wasn't a thing that, that women were really prioritized with, like there, there was no discussion with women about this. And then step four, negotiate everything. Ladies, we have to talk about pay. Women statistically earn less than men for the same work. But that gap gets even wider when we don't negotiate. Asking for what you're worth isn't just about getting more dollars in your paycheck. It's about showing the world and yourself that you value your time, energy, and expertise. Learn to negotiate, whether it's for a raise, a freelance contract, or even bills. And then step five, multiple streams of income. Relying on just one source of income can be limiting, even if you love your job. Think about diversifying your income streams, whether it's starting a side hustle, investing in rental properties, or creating passive income through creative projects. Think Etsy. The goal is to ensure you're never financially dependent on just one thing. Okay, now let's get philosophical for a second, because the truth is financial independence is a feminist act. 
When you take control of your finances, you're dismantling the systems that have kept women financially oppressed for generations. You're saying, I refuse to be dependent on anyone else for my security and my freedom. That, my friends, is powerful. Because money is not the root of all evil. It's the root of possibility. And for us as women, the more financially independent we become, the more we can create change, not just in our lives, but in the lives of others. When we lift ourselves up, we can lift up our communities, our sisters, and the next generation of women. Okay, let's wrap up with some action steps. Here's what you can do today to start taking control of your financial future. The first step, check your bank account. Start by getting familiar with your finances, whether joint accounts or separate accounts. Doesn't matter if you have a partner. Step two, create a budget. If you don't have one, now's the time. Keep it simple. Start initially with the money coming in and the money going out, your housing expenses, groceries, utilities, any car payments, stuff like that, just to try and get a feel for where the money's coming and going. And then the next step, set a savings goal. Even if it's just $50 this month, start saving something. When I was starting out, I started by saving $5 a week. That's it. Five bucks. And it it grew into much more than that. And the next step, learn about investing. Pick one resource, whether it's a book, a podcast, or a course, and educate yourself on investing. And then the last step, talk about money. Find a friend, a mentor, or a financial coach and have an honest conversation about your financial goals. And for those of you who have partners, talk with your partner about money. I know it's uncomfortable. I get it, especially as women, because it's almost like we are coming from a place of inferiority. It's almost like we're coming with our, our heads bowed and batting our eyelashes saying, can, can I have some money? No, no, we've got to take our power back. Get confident in why you need to talk with your partner about money. You have every right to discuss finances with your partner. You have every right to know what's coming in and what's going out and to plan for your future. Financial independence isn't just about numbers. It's about freedom, power, and possibility. It's about creating a life on your own terms. So let's stop being afraid of money. Let's stop apologizing for wanting it. And let's start owning our financial futures like the queens that we are. All right. Thank you so much for hanging out with me today, my hive. I know this was a bit different of a topic, especially compared to last week where I was angry. Um, Going from anger to finances, kind of a weird shift, isn't it? But um, it's actually one of the things that I started thinking about when I was talking about anger, because I recognized that finances are things that we never talk about. Um, because I was thinking of how like women suppress anger and stuff like that. I'm like, what else don't we talk about? Oh, money. Um, and to be very honest, as a therapist, a lot of times the problems that people talk to me about are financial. And so, yeah, I, I felt the need to do, uh, an episode on financial independence because, you know, like I said, it's about freedom, power, and possibility. We need that. So I hope that you are feeling fired up and ready to take some big, bold steps towards your financial independence. Remember, you've got everything you need to succeed inside of you. So keep pushing, 
keep thriving, and keep amplifying your own voice because you've got this. Until next time, Hive, I'm Kelly Hint, and this is The Hint Hive, amplifying women's voices. Stay fierce, stay focused, and go get that financial freedom. Catch you next week. This podcast is powered by Kelly Hint Empowerment Coaching, as well as Kelly M. Hint LMHC and The Cranky Counselor. To find out more about coaching services, head over to CoachKellyHint.com. If you'd like to know more about the psychotherapy services I offer to individuals within the state of New York, you can check out KellyMHint.com. And if you'd like to learn more about aromatherapy, you can check out TheCrankyCounselor.com.